Welcome to today's broadcast. At Liberty Church, we believe in helping people. Metro Detroit is an area that is filled with hurting people. Here at Liberty, we have a mobile food pantry that feeds hundreds of families each week. We've helped many needy families with housing, transportation, utilities, and free daycare. We have an annual outreach that provides school supplies, backpacks, haircuts, bike repairs, and more for hundreds of families. We believe in the power of giving, and we invite you to partner with us in bringing hope to the hopeless and healing to those who are hurting. Each week, we have to turn away several people who need our help. Your gift will help us to help them. Now, you can give online through our website at libertychurchmi.com slash give. The need is huge, and our vision is just as big. But we need more resources to help address the growing demand of people in need. Thank you for your support. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Uh, we have been studying the book of Romans. The title of this series is called Don't Judge Me? Question mark. And it has a lot to do with that attitude, that mentality in our world today where people uh, don't want you to judge them. But you know, it's funny that anytime somebody says that statement, don't judge me, they're actually judging the person uh, that, that they think is judging them, right? We get so defensive. We, we want to justify what we do in our life, but, but we want to criticize what everybody else does in our life. We want people to extend mercy to us, but we have a hard time extending mercy to others. And we're going to talk a lot about that in the next couple weeks. Uh, last week, we talked about righteousness. The week before that, we talked about faith. The week before that, we talked about the law. And this has really been a good series. And I encourage you, uh, if you've missed any of, it, any of it, to go back to our website and to look at these because we're building upon these precepts. They're all connected together, and uh, if you don't connect them together, sometimes you might miss the sense of what we're trying to say. There's been a lot of false teaching, I think, in the church uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, there are some people that have become prominent on television and, and uh, ministers, if you will, uh, televangelists, people that uh, I think are preaching a false teaching about grace. Uh, we had a, an instance... Uh, five or six years ago, where there was a family in our church that was following one of these ministers. And uh, what they teach basically is that grace gives you the excuse, the justification to live however you want to live. And it takes away the obligation to do what God tells you to do. And they had been listening to this person and following this person. And I tell you, it's a very alluring message. You know, go out and live however you want. God's grace is sufficient for you. And that is a scripture in the Bible, but that's not what that means. It's, it's, it's a false teaching. And so to start the year like I, I do very often, I began to, to talk about some of the disciplines that God wants us to do as believers. And I began to talk about the Great Commission, that God's called us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel and to share our faith with other people, that that's not a suggestion, but that's something that, that is an obligation for us as believers to take this wonderful experience we've had with God and to share it with other people. And uh, before I was even done speaking, uh, the entire family, they were sit seated over here, uh, got up and walked out in the middle of my message. It wasn't in the middle, but toward the end of my message. And so I called them later. I said, well, everything all right? Was there a family emergency? They said, no, Pastor, we believe in grace, and you were preaching works, and we won't be back to the church. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I, I was preaching a commandment of God. But apparently under your teaching of grace, the commandment of God, the commandments of God are insignificant, that they don't mean anything because of grace. And this is completely contrary to what the Bible teaches, I believe. And so we need to, to understand. We talked about last week the scripture where it says where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And some people can take that to say, see, I can sin all I want to because there's an abundance of grace, but that's not what it's talking about. It says that no matter how powerful sin is to control your life, grace is more powerful. No matter how much sin seems to want to carry you in a destructive direction, grace is more powerful to take you towards God, to propel you to be closer to God. Amen? That's what that verse means. In, in fact, in the Greek, it means not that grace will abound, but grace will superabound, that grace always overcomes sin. And that's really the highlight of our message this morning. That's the, the theme of our message this morning, that grace is to help us overcome sin. And so we're going to talk about that. Let's look what it says here in Romans chapter 6 in verse 1. Paul writes, he says, well then, should we keep on sinning 
so that grace or God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace, the King James says, so that grace can, can uh, abound more and more? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Should we go on sinning so that grace can abound, so that we can have this abundance of grace in our life? Paul says, of course not. You, and that's pretty strong language back in Bible days. You know, that, that would be the equivalent of us to go, that's so stupid. Why would you keep on sinning so that you could get more grace? Paul says, since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in sin? Now, let me encourage you this morning. There's a balance to the Bible. Thank God for that. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not beating you up for sin this morning, but I'm giving you uh, some encouragement in how to overcome sin. How to overcome that destructive lifestyle that is leading you down a path that leads to destruction. There is a power, there is an authority, there is an ability to live the life that God has called you to live. Uh, we talked last week about the scripture in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. It says that God has given us, if we learn how to receive it, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness so that we can reign, R-E-I-G-N, in life, so that we can live a victorious life. Those two elements. Last week we talked about the gift of righteousness. This week we're talking about the abundance of grace, that God gives us the abundance of grace so that we don't keep on sinning, so that we don't keep on living destructive lifestyle, so that we can reign, we can have victory in life. Amen. And you know, it's, it's amazing how so many Christians are wired to think when it comes to victory, we, we want to use that grace, we want to use our faith to have victory in our finances. And God wants you to have that. And to have victory uh, over sickness in our body. And God wants you to have that. But that same experience, that same uh, uh, thing that Jesus did on the cross, that same act of love, that same uh, dynamic of Jesus dying on the cross was not only to produce your salvation and your healing and your deliverance and, and financial blessing for you, but it was also there to, to, to make available to us the power to overcome sin in our life. When we talked about faith, we talked about faith. God gives us faith to please him. Amen. And so many people use their faith for a new car, or a new house, a better job, and, and that's okay. But use your faith to please God too. Amen. Use your faith to overcome sin. In John chapter 1 and verse 16, Jesus was speaking about grace. And he gives us an indication that there was a transition that happened from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That there was an exchange, of gra that grace changed somehow. And he uses this phrase, he says, God has given us grace for grace. That there was some dynamic that happened within that, that definition of that word grace that changed because Jesus died on the cross. And in the Old Testament, I believe that God gave grace to Israel because of their sin, in spite of their sin that he kept them from being destroyed, that he kept his hand upon them in spite of their, their sinful lifestyle, their, their idolatry, their adultery, their, 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 their worship of pagan gods, all the stuff that they, they did in the Old Testament, God still protected them. He still called them his children. And, and that was really kind of the definition of, of grace. And we, we always use the acronym God's riches at Christ's expense. But it, it's unmerited favor. They didn't deserve the favor of God. They didn't deserve those things and God gave them grace. But that's still true today, but there's a transition that there's, there's something that happened because of the cross. There's something that happened because of Jesus that gives us a, a new dynamic to the word of grace. No matter how hard they tried, they could not overcome sin in the Old Testament. Sin was a force. Sin was something that controlled them. Sin that was something that dominated their life because they lived under the influence of, of their flesh. But Jesus at the cross became sin. They lived under a curse, but through Jesus, we've been set free from that curse. Amen. And there's a new dynamic to grace. And, and I don't want to uh, spoil my message this morning. We'll talk a little bit about that. But I want you to understand those things. God has called us to live a new life. We've been called to live a new life in Christ Jesus. But before we can live a new life, we have to die to the old life. Before you can live a new life, you have to die. You know, people talk about reincarnation. You know, Pastor, do you believe in reincarnation? Yeah, my sinful life died and I've been reincarnated as a believer, a child of God. 
Amen. My old man died and here I've come back. I'm a new Christian. I'm a new believer. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm bought by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm filled with his Holy Spirit. God has changed me. I'm not the same person I used to be. I come back as somebody that's filled with faith and power. I, I, I died as, a, as a, a very shy, quiet introvert and I come back. The Bible says the righteous are bold as a lion. That's how I've been reincarnated. Hallelujah. Spiritually, not physically. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. In Romans chapter 6 and, and verse 4, Paul talks about this. He says, we, were, we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. For what? To live a new life, a life of victory, a life of, of joy, a life of peace, a life of power. Hallelujah. A life that's filled with the light of God. But true believers carry around a dead person. What does this mean? Our flesh is spiritually dead. Our flesh is what used to dominate us. Our flesh is what used to control us as believers. And you may be sitting here going, Pastor, my flesh still dominates and controls me. That's what this grace of God is for, to change that dynamic in your life. But as, as believers, Paul writes this in, in Romans 7, verse 24. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, we, we died with Christ. We were buried with him in baptism. That old nature, that old person, that, that old desire, that, 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 that old thing that used to control you died when you became a believer. But how many of you know that sometimes it wants to resurrect in your life? Why? Because we carry it around, because it lives in our flesh. I remember as a young believer praying to God one time, the desires that, that, that I hated in my life, the things that I didn't want to do. And Paul talks about this, and we'll talk more about it next week, but we all have this battle on the inside. The things we don't uh, want to do are the things that we do. The things we want to do are the things that we don't do. And that's where Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I remember praying one time to God. I said, God, I don't want to do these things. Take that desire away from me. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak clearly to me. He said, I could do that, but I'd have to kill you first. And I said, what are you talking about, God? He said, those desires live in your flesh. And until you die, they will be something you're going to struggle with. See? This is the dead man that we carry around, is our flesh. You know, back in Bible days, Paul says this because there was an actual experience that people would go through. If somebody had committed a very serious crime, like murder, for instance, they were often sentenced to a punishment where they would carry that dead body around, where they, where they would take that dead carcass and strap it to that person's back, and that person would have to carry that body around until that body became so decayed and broken down that that death and those worms, if you will, crawled into their body. And they knew what it was like to experience death. And Paul said that we experience this in some ways, that we carry that dead nature, that old man, that, that fleshly nature around. And we have to be careful that we don't allow it, the death, the stench, the, the, the uh, wickedness of our past to, to contaminate the spiritual life that God has for us. We died to the control of sin, but yet we still carry it around in our flesh. And so we can't allow the death of our sinful flesh to uh, affect our spiritual life. Are you with me this morning? Amen. In Romans chapter 6, let's read this in verses 6 and 7. He says, We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. When we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. But we used to be slaves to this sin. That's number two in your outline. We used to be servants of sin, but we're no longer. This verse says, 
We used to be slaves to sin. Now, when you use that word slaves, all of us kind of get a little bit of a mental picture. And, and slaves in Bible times were a little bit different than what maybe you're thinking today. A lot of times a person would go and serve somebody to pay off a debt that they owed for them, owed to them. And sometimes that person enjoyed what they did so much, living with that family, that that family would adopt them and they would permanently. Now, I, I know there was some abuse in slavery, and I'm not trying to minimize that, but it was, like I said, different in, in Bible days that these people, uh, again, it, it was not necessarily a forced slavery. It was an obligation where they became a servant of a household to pay off a debt that they, they had with them. And uh, it was often by choice, and yes, they were in, su in some way owned by their master, but uh, it was something that many times became a more favorable lifestyle to them where they became part of the family. And even after their debt was paid off, they stayed where they were. And so when he says here a slave, it's, it's more of a servant to sin. But we're not a servant to sin any longer. Because of Jesus, we have no obligation to sin. The debt to sin has been paid off through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been set free. Just like that servant or that slave, when the debt was paid off, the, the, the master would look at them and say, your debt's been paid, you're now free. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, the debt that we had to the flesh was paid. There was no obligation to live that way any longer. We have been set free by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we are free to, to not live according to the obligation and the debt of the flesh any longer. But by Christ Jesus, we've been set free. Jesus died to give us power over sin, power to overcome sin. Look what it says in Romans 8 and verse 3. It says, God sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. If you're old enough, you're familiar with the phrase that the devil made me do it, right? And you know, there's times in my life where I kind of feel like that, where sin controls me so much that I don't have a choice, but that's not true. As a believer, you have a choice that the, 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 the power of sin is no longer something that controls you, that you have power over sin. Sin no longer has power over you. And so we need to learn how to walk in that power, the power that we have over sin, and that is called grace. The sin in, that, that, that Adam imparted to us is not an action, it was a force. You know, people talk about the, the phrase original sin. People in the Old Testament were not able to be close to God. They were not right with God. It wasn't because of the sins, plural, that they committed. It was because of the force of sin, the nature of sin that was passed down to them through Adam. And so we need to distinguish between sins and sin. There's a difference between the force of sin, the power of sin, and the sins that you commit. When you become a believer, the power of sin is broken in your life. You are set free from sin. Hallelujah. But how many of you know you still commit sins? Right? And God understands that. That's why he says, I write these things to you that you don't sin. But if you do, we have a heavenly father that we can come to. And the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's a, a difference in this understanding. People in the Old Testament committed sins because of the power of sin that was passed down to them through Adam. Today, that power of the force of sin has been broken. And if we commit sins, it's not because of that. It's because we don't understand our righteousness. It's because we don't understand the power of grace. It's because we don't understand who we are in Christ Jesus. It's because we don't understand that that, that man is dead and he no longer has power over us, that we have power over him, that we can dominate those things and we don't need to let those things dominate us. Amen. We need to understand these things, that believers are dead to the power of sin. In verse 11 here in Romans 6, he says, You also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. Number three, grace empowers us to live this new lifestyle. You've been called to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. In fact, 
If you're familiar with that, familiar with that verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that, that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. If you study it in the Greek, it says, let us become new creatures in Christ Jesus. God is calling us to a higher lifestyle. God is calling us upward. God is calling us to, to live a life that is not only pleasing to him, but a life that's filled with his love and his, his mercy and his grace and his, his joy and his peace. He's calling us higher. He's calling us up to, to a higher lifestyle. Paul said, I, I've learned to forget those things which are behind and press on to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And grace is available to us to empower us to live that higher lifestyle. Amen. That's the good news I have for you today. I'm not trying to beat you up because of your sin, but I'm also not trying to excuse your sin and say, it's okay, go ahead and sin all you want to. God's got grace for you. No, because sin leads to death. Sin leads to destruction. If I were to encourage you to live that lifestyle and excuse it and justify it, what, how much uh, love would I have for you? That shows I don't care about you. But I am challenging you today that God has made a way, a pathway to go higher, to live stronger, to have victory. Look what it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. We're pretty much covering the whole chapter 6 here this morning. Paul says, don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to sinful desires. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead. You were dead. But now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. You no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And again, people read that and go, so I'm free to do whatever I want. No, God's grace, when it says the freedom of God's grace, he's talking about freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. Oh, that's good. I needed to put that in the notes. We have a freedom, not to sin, but from sin. And I love this passage. I've used it many times when I struggle in my life. He says, the, take the, the members of your body, whether it's your eyes, your ears, your hands, and use them not as instruments of sin, but instruments of righteousness. Oftentimes it's our flesh that are those instruments of sin. And God wants us to be careful what we listen to, what we watch, what we do, where we go with our feet and begin to use these as instruments of righteousness. I've prayed this as a prayer many times. God, I yield my members, the members of my body to you as instruments of righteousness to do good, to do your will. So, when we were slaves or servants to sin, we didn't have a choice in that. We were born into that. But becoming a servant of God is a choice that we have. And I want to challenge you this morning. Choose to be God's servant. Choose to serve the Lord. Verse 15, it goes on. He says, well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you became the slave of whatever you choose to obey? Think about that for just a minute. You become the slave of whatever you choose to obey. Adam chose to obey the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Until that point, God said, you have dominion. You are able to subdue everything. You are able to conquer. You are in charge of the world, Adam. I created this for you. Rule it, conquer it, have dominion. But Adam chose to obey the serpent instead of obey God. And he was a servant of God, but he became a servant of destruction. He had the choice. We didn't have that choice at first. We were born into that. But when you chose to be a believer, when you chose to accept Christ, when you chose to be a servant of God, you choose to obey him, he becomes your master. Hallelujah. Now you talk about a whole different definition of slavery. 
you want to be a slave to God. Because in his kingdom, everything he has belongs to you. When you become his servant, he bestows upon you what the Bible calls joy unspeakable and full of glory, peace that passes understanding. He is a good master. He goes on in verse 16, he says, you can be a slave to sin which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God which leads to righteous living. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Hallelujah. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So as a believer, sin is not a force, it's a choice. Are you with me this morning? Before you came to Christ, sin was, was a force in your life. But Jesus, through the work of the cross, has destroyed the power of that force in your life. And so now sin is a choice. Romans 13, verse 14, the, the Living Bible says this, But ask the Lord Jesus Christ to help you to live as you should. And don't make plans to enjoy evil. Amen? Amen. You know, a lot of times we make plans to sin. We choose. We're going to do this. But the Bible says don't make plans to sin. Choose to serve the Lord. And ask the Lord to help you live as you should. And when we pray for grace, that's what we're doing. If you choose to sin, the reward of sin, verse 23 of Romans 6 says, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So again, don't get sucked into that death. Don't carry that dead man around and let it eat away at your spiritual life. Choose obedience. Choose God. Choose grace. Every time we sin, one of the worms from our dead flesh crawls inside of us and tries to take residence in our spirit. Cut that off. Cut it off. Number uh, six, or four it should be. I got my Roman numerals backwards. Grace is a gift that we're to give to others. And this is an amazing part of grace to me. You know, there's many different forms of the word grace. Be graceful, be gracious. I'm amazed at how many people become Christians and God has forgiven their sin, but they're so legalistic when it comes to other people. The most legalistic people that I've run across in the church, eventually, this has happened almost every time, you will find that there is some very dark, destructive sin that they are struggling with. And they are so quick to point out everybody else's sin. And you find that they're struggling with this thing that you're like, oh my gosh, really? And you're going to point out everybody else's flaws when you're struggling with that? That's called legalism. And that's not grace. That's got nothing to do with grace. In Romans chapter 7, Paul deals with this in verses 9 and 10. He says, at one time I lived without understanding of the law. But when I learned the commandment not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. He says if you, you understand the law, you want to live by the law, you want to be legalistic, it really gives fuel to sin. When, when you want to live by the law, it doesn't destroy the power to sin it, in fact, Paul says what he's learned is it seems to increase a desire to sin in your life. So we don't want to be legalistic to people. We don't, we don't want to say these are the rules and you've got to obey all of them. We want to be gracious to people so that God will be gracious to us. But you have to understand that sometimes when you lay down with the law with people, it inspires a desire in them to sin all that much more. I remember when we were kids growing up, mom would often go Christmas shopping and she'd hide the gifts in the garage. We always seemed to own a boat. She'd either hide them in the boat in the garage or up in the attic of the garage. 
And she'd come in the house a couple weeks before Christmas and she'd say, I don't want any of you kids going in the garage. <laughs> well, you know what that did. I, I could have been, not gone in the garage for four months, but you know I'm going in the garage, right? Why? Because you gave us a law. And the law just encourages sin all that much more. So when it comes to sin, we have a choice as believers. We can approach it with the law, and I'm not trying to do that this morning. Or you can approach it with grace. And Jesus came to give us grace. In John chapter 1, verses 14 and verse 17, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as, uh, uh, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, you want to preach truth like we did this morning, that sin is destructive and sin is wrong and sin is not something you should aspire to. But you need to preach grace too. And again, grace is not the, the uh, encouragement to sin, but the power to overcome sin. Did you write down what I said earlier? Because I forgot it. What was that? I should have wrote it in my notes. It, 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 it's, we're not encouraging grace so that you can sin, but so that you overcome sin. So we need to teach truth, but extend grace. In Romans 3.23, we studied this earlier. It says, every one of us has sin and falls short of God's glorious standard. We need to understand that. We've all been there. We've all sinned. And so we need to extend grace. Another definition of the word grace are the gifts that God gives us. The word grace in the, in the New Testament is the Greek word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. It's where we get the word charisma. And the word charisma means a gift. And so the word grace is a gift. It's a gift that God has given us. And some of you have a grace from God that is an, a talent, an ability might be a musical gift, might be an administrative gift, a leadership gift, might be a financial gift, it might be a, a, a gift of, a, a, of compassion, whatever it might be, that's a grace that God has given to you. Some people like to call these spiritual giftings, but really it's a grace, it's a grace that God has given you. In Romans 12, verses 6 through 9, it says, In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, <clears throat> speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. So God has given us a, a, a gift of grace to help other people overcome their sin. Not to be legalistic and expose their sin, but to support them in encouraging, in leading, in giving, in compassion, to help them overcome their sin. We need to understand the word grace because I think it's been often very mistaught in the church. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 19, and there was a popular song based on this verse a few years ago, several years ago. The New Living Translation says, I want you to be wise in doing right and stay innocent of any wrong. And, and that word and is in most translations, the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. It says, be excellent at what is good. In other words, he's saying, don't be excellent at evil. Don't be excellent at sin. You want to aspire to be good at something? Don't aspire to be a good sinner. Be a lousy sinner. Be excellent at what is good and be innocent of evil. And if you do this, the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Any of you been struggling with Satan? How do you crush him underneath your feet? By the grace of God. By the grace of God.
the grace of God is given to us to crush Satan underneath our feet. It is a power. It is an authority. It is an ability to overcome sin in our life. The power, I guess the best, best definition that I can give you is grace is the power to live the life God has called you to live. You ever read the Bible and get discouraged? Because you're like, God, I don't know if I can ever do that. You know, we read a verse a minute ago about living by God's holy standard. God's got some high standards, doesn't he? That's what the law was all about, was to expose God's standards to us. To expose to us what's acceptable to God and what's not. And it wasn't there to, to discourage us, it was to encourage us. And so when you read the Bible and you go, man, God, I don't know if I can ever get there. That's what grace is for. That's what that verse means when it says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is perfected in your weakness. When you read those things and you say, I don't think I can do it. No, you can't. That's what grace is for. That's why you pray, God, give me grace. God, give me grace. I need your grace, Lord. And God says, my grace will get you there. My grace is sufficient for you. God, I'm too weak to live like that. My strength is perfected in your weakness. Hallelujah. You can defeat the power of sin. You can defeat Satan in your life. You can overcome that habit. You can break through that discouragement. You can break through that depression. You can break through that, that gambling habit. You can break through that addiction. You can break through those things that seem like they have control over you. You don't have to sit there and go, the devil made me do it. No, devil, you're a liar. In the name of Jesus, I resist you. I renounce you. I break the power of sin in my life. Crush him underneath your feet. Crush him underneath your feet. I was praying this morning, and I encourage you, we have a prayer time at 9.15 every Sunday. Come and pray with us. I believe God has a, a plan for a great movement in our church, but it will only be birthed through prayer. Saints, we got to begin to pray. I talked about the people you've been inviting to church. It takes more than an invitation you got to get on your face and begin to pray for them. We have prayer here on Tuesdays at 9.30. We pray for people to be saved. I prayed this morning for people to be saved. I'm praying for backsliders to come home. If we really love people and we care about them, we got to get on our face and pray. And I was reminded as I was praying this morning of, of a passage in Zechariah 4, and you can just, just write down Zechariah 4, 7, and you can look it up later, but... God was commissioning the nation of Israel to his plan for them and his desire for them to, to rebuild after devastation and destruction. And in their heart, it was a mountain that was too big for them to climb. And God said to Zechariah, he says, that mountain will be made flat with shouts of grace, grace, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe you've got a mountain in your life that you think is too big to climb. When you speak grace to that mountain, God says, I will flatten that mountain in your life. We need to learn how to pray, and I pray every day, God, I pray for your grace. I need your grace. There are mountains in my life that we need to begin to shout grace to that mountain. God, it's too big for me. God, I can't climb it. God, I can't move it. God, I can't overcome it. But grace in the name of Jesus. I speak grace. I need your grace, God. And watch God flatten those mountains in your life. Amen? That's what grace is for. That's what grace is for. Not to justify the mountain, but to flatten the mountain in your life. Let's bow our heads this morning. You all listen so good, I could preach all day. God is so good. Father, we thank you for your word today. Your word is here to inspire us, Lord. And we would be remiss if we just heard it and did not act upon it. So God, we pray today that you help us to take what we've learned and apply it to our life, Lord. To stop justifying our sin, Lord God to stop living under the power of death and destruction 
that we are new creatures and you've called us to a new life. God, give us your grace to live that life you've called us to live, Lord, we pray. Well, heads are bowed and people are praying. If you're here this morning and you've never become a Christian, you don't know what the grace of God is. You've never experienced the grace of God. And sin is not necessarily a choice in your life. It's a force that you want to get out from under. You can feel it pulling you in a direction you don't want to go. And you want to change. You want God to change your life today. I want to give you the opportunity to pray with us this morning. We're not here to embarrass you, expose you. We're not going to ask you to stand up or come forward. We're not, we're not into pointing you out. This is between you and God this morning. But I do believe that God's grace is received through faith. So I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith this morning. If you're watching us online, take this step of faith right where you're at. God is speaking to you today. I challenge you. While your heads are bowed, everyone's praying here. Nobody's looking around. Take a step of faith and just lift your hand. You can put it down as fast as you put it up. Pastor, that's me. I'm being sucked down a path of destruction. And I make a choice today. I want to choose grace. I want to choose God today. I want a power in my life to overcome the thing that is destroying me. I need God's grace today. That's you. Just lift your hand up. You can put it down as fast as you lift it up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I believe God's dealing with people's hearts today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. I know as a kid, when I was younger, I used to put it off. Well, that was good, and maybe next week I'll give my life to God. Today is your day. Don't procrastinate. We're not even promised next week. Today's your day. Don't try to clean your life up to give it to God. You can't. Give it to him just as you are right now. I'm going to ask one more time if that's you. Just lift your hand up and you put it right back down. Pastor, that's me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the courage and the boldness that you displayed this morning. It takes guts to do this right now. And I pray, fathers, we pray this prayer that you will visit these people today that have had the courage and the faith to say, God, I need you. Visit them in a powerful, transformational way today, God, I pray. Pray this prayer with me. If you raise your hand, we're all going to pray it together. Say this. Say, God, I cry out to you today for your grace. I've been walking a path that leads to destruction. And today I repent. I ask you to forgive me. And I make a choice to turn completely around and to head in a different direction. I want to live for you. I give you control of my life. And I ask you for your grace to live the life that you've called me to live. I make a commitment to walk in that direction, to pursue you, as my master, to be your servant from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, Father, I pray for anyone that raised their hand today, or maybe those that didn't because they weren't sure. If they prayed that prayer, sincerely meant it from their heart today. God, I ask you to visit them. God, overwhelm them. I know the day I, I prayed that prayer, God, there was such a sense of your love and your peace and your joy that overwhelmed me. I pray, God, give them that sense right now, Lord God. Invade their heart as they've opened it and invited you in. Invade it with your mercy and your grace and your presence today, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you enjoyed this series?